You are watching DHTV from California State University to Vegas Hills. Hello, good morning. My name is Mike Fraga, and I am your guide to a course called IDS 318. Uh, interdisciplinary Approach to Cultural Pluralism, Immigration in the United States. And I will be a guide to a course that seeks to understand some of the issues that concern the contemporary United States community, um, especially with regards to immigration. Now, the historical experiences of the diverse immigrant populations that created and continue to create the economic and social foundation of the United States uh, that's what we're going to be doing in this class, is surveying their experiences, along with the legal steps uh, an immigrant must follow to achieve citizenship. Uh, the idea behind this course is to bring an awareness uh, to the contemporary human crisis uh, regarding immigration. So this course uh, explores immigration policy and its effects on all communities residing in the United States today. And we will take a look at all of the different communities that form part of this nation and their contributions to the creation of this nation. We will start with Native Americans, experience European expressions, uh, move to Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Mexico, and Latin America. Now, the purpose of this course is to learn about the dilemma of U.S. immigration, its history, policy, and current crisis. Now, even though the United States is and always has been a nation of immigrants. When we talk about the immigration process, it evokes a wide range of responses from various sectors of the U.S. population. Um, and of course, this includes fear, anxiety, sympathy, hate, ethnocentrism, misunderstanding, racial profiling, scapegoating, and xenophobia. Yet, immigrants continue to come to the United States in search of work, uh, family unification, better opportunities, asylum, and refuge. So this course will focus on a wide range of immigrant communities, and it seeks to assess their struggles to become part of the American social fabric. So hopefully in this course, students, uh, at the end of this semester, uh, we will be able to understand and, and make sense of the diverse histories of immigration in the United States, where we will be describing major political, economic, and experiential trends that defined each experience. We will hope to define and articulate an understanding of the processes of acculturation and assimilation, as well as the processes of hybridity and transculturation. And the idea behind this course uh, is to uh, assist in relating the internal discourse of a specific immigrant community to philosophical and experiential origins of, for immigrant identity, for what in, in the case of Latin America, transboundary consciousness, and the historical consequences. And the idea, uh, hopefully at the end of this semester, we will be able to evaluate lines of reasoning leading to specific constructions of race, ethnicity, class, and history and their viability and their potential for supporting ethical, personal, and communal relations. We will be comparing and contrasting Mexican, African, Latin American, European, Asian, Middle Eastern contributions to the historical development of the United States society through immigration policy and experience. So, <clears throat> welcome to this class. And um, for those of you who are there in cable land, there is an 800 number that is available for you if you are watching live. And by all means, please call in uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, about the topics that will be covered today. Uh, students, uh, please take advantage of the online address and chat with me as we explore concepts for this course. Please go over the syllabus carefully to understand what is being asked of you as we journey down the path that immigrants have taken and uh, towards citizenship. In today's presentation, what we're going to be doing is concentrating 
on the concepts that we will be used that will be used throughout the course. <clears throat> we want to become familiar with terms and processes of change that will assist us in appreciating U.S. immigration, its history, policy, and current crisis. So as we become familiar with the terms today, uh, I want to introduce the history of immigration restriction legislation by reviewing past congressional and state-sponsored laws so as to understand U.S. society's historical treatment of the immigrant question. So perhaps by doing this, we can come to an appreciation of the crisis that is confronting the United States today, especially with this current administration. So please understand that today's session introduces us to this course. And uh, please recognize that future sessions will take in-depth looks at the experiences of all peoples who make up the citizenry of the United States. There's going to be sessions that are going to be devoted specifically to understanding uh, the experiences of Native peoples, of Europeans, of Middle Easterners, of Africans, of African Americans, of Asians, Asian Americans, of Mexicans, Chicanos, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and the Caribbean and Central American populations. We'll be covering the entire experience, especially with regards to immigration uh, and, and the experiences of immigrants in the United States. Now, the latter part of the course, what we're going to be doing is dedicating the, uh, dedicating the course to the study of the naturalization process and the steps towards citizenship so we can understand this debate that's going on with regards to the, uh, immigration, the immigrant status or immigrant experiences. Um, finally, we're going to conclude this course by appreciating the immigrant rights and responsibilities. In this way, we'll come to an appreciation of the current crisis engulfing the U.S. in specific, and of course, capitalism in general. So I'd like uh, for, for right now to um, introduce you to the first uh, the textbooks that we're going to be using in this class. Um, one of the things that's important uh, uh, that this, this course uh, adopts the university's affordable learning solutions uh, program. So both required textbooks and remaining course readings and viewing resources are going to be available for you students on Blackboard and uh, through the CSUDH library. Uh, so please, again, when you're reviewing the syllabus, refer, refer to the course calendar and to Blackboard for specific readings and viewing citations. And so let's appreciate uh, one of the required textbooks uh, for this course, and that is Juan Gonzalez's award-winning Harvest of Empire. And so if we can uh, get an image of that uh, book, this is the book that we're going to be uh, using. Uh, Juan Gonzalez is a Puerto Rican by birth, and he was a co-founder of the Puerto Rican Civil Rights Group, famously known as the Young Lords. Uh, in 2012, a documentary was produced which addressed the issues that were raised in Gonzalez's Harvest of Empire. Um, so students, you are required to get the latest edition of this book. It was originally published in 1999, and then it was brought up to date in 2011 because of the heated controversies surrounding immigration under the uh, uh, George W. Bush administrations and the Obama uh, uh, President Barack Obama's administration. Um, Democracy Now! writes that at a time of heated and divisive debate over immigration, uh, this new feature-length documentary known as Harvest of Empire, of which students you will be able to view um, through this course, uh, examines the direct connection between the long history of U.S. intervention in Latin America and the immigration crisis we've, we face today. So based on the groundbreaking book by award-winning journalist Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez, Harvest of Empire is going to take an unflinching look at the role uh, of, that the U.S. economic and military interests play in triggering an unprecedented wave of migration that is transforming our nation's cultural and economic landscape. Let's go to a film clip that helps us appreciate uh, Juan Gonzalez's book. Divisive debate over immigration, we turn to a new documentary out this week, Harvest of Empire, the untold story of Latinos in America. 
The film is based on a book by Juan Gonzalez, Democracy Now! co-host, New York Times columnist. The film examines how you, and New York Daily News uh, columnist, the film examines how U.S. intervention in Latin America and the Caribbean forced millions of people to leave their homes to migrate to the United States. We'll be joined by Juan and the film's co-director in a minute, but first a clip from the trailer for Harvest of Empire. streets of our country were taken over today by people who don't belong here. When well, the immigrants come, they come with a culture of criminality. It's out of control. They put a strain on our social security, our education, our health care. They never teach us in school that the huge Latino presence here is a direct result of our own government's actions in Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America over many decades. Thousands upon thousands of Puerto Ricans were actually recruited to come work here in the United States. The feeling was we could very easily overthrow this progressive government and make it a lot easier for the United Fruit Company and other American businesses to operate in Central America. From the very beginning, the West depended for its labor on Mexicans. Are you a communist leader? Yes. Wait for the history. The history will say what we are. I had never seen anything like El Salvador. I was more frightened there than Vietnam. What was going on there was the slaughter of the innocents. When you finance and train a gang of uniformed butchers and they begin wholesale killing, the people don't emigrate, they flee. The instability that we have contributed to creates the kind of chaos and disarray that leads to more immigration. I believe in the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots even though they may have entered illegally. The reality is that America is changing. By the end of this century, a majority of the people will trace their origins not to Europe, but to Latin America. We're all humans, we all have the same abilities, we all have the same potential. America has always been a nation in the process of becoming, in the process of change. It is an immigrant nation. An excerpt of Harvest of Empire premiering this week in New York and Los Angeles based on the book Harvest of Empire, History of Latinos in America uh, by the award-winning journalist and Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez. Juan, again, a co-host with the New York Daily News, author of three other books including News for All the People, The Epic Story of Race and the American Media, which is also just out in paperback, and founder and past president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. We're very pleased that Juan is with us here in the New York studio, not in his usual guest chair, uh, but as a guest, uh, and not in his usual host chair, but as a guest today. And along with the film's co-director, Eduardo Lopez, we welcome you both to Democracy Now! Thanks. And it's a different perspective on this side of the table. <laughs> That's right. So, um, you wrote this book years ago, Juan. Then it came out again, updated, and now it's in a film. Why have you chosen to go this route? Well, it wasn't my choice, really. It was the, the, the producers who came to me several years ago. They, they've actually been working on this film for about, a, uh, I think it's seven years seven now? Seven years. Yeah, and uh, they, they came to me several years ago that they really were excited about the perspective that my book had been, uh, uh, had, was putting out. Uh, my book actually came out in 1999 initially, and it's now, I think, used in about 200 college courses around the country as sort of a, a, an introductory survey text on the Latino community in the United States. And, uh, and they said they wanted to make it into a film. And I said, are you sure? It's, my book is kind of more of a history, and, it's, and it delves. It's kind of complicated because it goes into every one of the different Latino groups in the country, how they came here, what drove them here. And, but they said they thought they had a way to do it. Eduardo, uh, the way? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, the way was uh, quite difficult because it was a seven-year journey uh, between the time we first met with Juan about the book uh, and, um, and today. And uh, I really would not be sitting here with you if it wasn't for the hard work and sacrifice of the producer of the film, Wendy Thompson Marcus. And, and with her, we felt in 2005 that the kind of language that was being used to describe uh, immigrants, and specifically Latino immigrants in the media, was just unacceptable. 
um, every night you would hear uh, very derogatory terms being used to describe us. And we being, uh, both of us being Latino immigrants, Wendy from Peru and me from El Salvador, we knew the real story. And we had read the real story in Juan's book and we just felt compelled to take action because we really felt that uh, the United States, that our fellow citizens needed to know why Latinos had come to the United States, the real reasons, the roots, the, the root causes of immigration. And in just about all of the cases when you look at history, you see very clearly, as Juan explains in the book, that our different waves of, of migration are connected to actions that the United States took in our countries in different times for different reasons, but it's very consistent throughout history, this connection between our foreign policy and immigration. And so Okay, we had a little technical difficulty there. Um, <clears throat> so students, that's the, the first textbook that we're gonna be using is Juan Gonzalez's uh, Harvest of Empire, uh, one of the most fascinating works right now that deals and addresses the issues that are related to immigration and the crisis that we are facing today on immigration. The other textbook that we're gonna be using is Terrio's, um, as you will take a look on, at on, on, um, in this course syllabus, is Susan Terrio's uh, whose Child Am I? And uh, this particular work uh, is very important. Um, um, uh, but I guess a couple of years ago, um, there was this huge groundswell of uh, anti-immigrant sentiment uh, towards children who had appeared in South Texas and uh, over hundreds of children that just appeared all of a sudden uh, uh, in South Texas coming from Central America coming from uh, El Salvador, um, Guatemala, and Honduras. And uh, the Obama administration was caught off guard uh, in, in wondering, wondering what to do with these children. Uh, so this is a, a very important work uh, for us in this class. Um, one of the reasons why I selected this, uh, this book is that it will help us appreciate what happens uh, to the children who, of, of immigrants who come into the United States and uh, how the United States responds to their particular experiences. And this particular book ties directly into uh, Juan Gonzalez's work, um, whereas Juan Gonzalez takes a look at policy implications with regards to uh, the United States and U.S. foreign policy in Latin America and, causes, and what causes the groundswell. Here we're gonna have a book that addresses specifically uh, the childhood experiences of um, those uh, who have come across and then who have been deported. Uh, and uh, Terrio does a very good job of uh, looking at their experiences when they cross into the United States, what happens when they are in immigration, uh, when, when um, uh, they are, are then caught, and then how they are sent back and what happens when they return. So <clears throat> it's a very appropriate title. And so students, <clears throat> one of the requirements in this course is that you um, review this book and you have to pass it. Uh, you, you have to read it and you have to uh, write a book review uh, that will be uh, uh, receive a successful grade for you to pass this class. So we'll be taking a look at Whose Child Am I? Um, so <clears throat> those are the two books. Welcome to the class. What I'd like to do is now introduce you to some concepts, uh, terms, um, uh, identifications that we will be using in this class. So. Uh, what I'm going to be asking you students, those of you who are uh, watching, and <clears throat> I'm hoping that uh, even those of you in the audience, those of you who have tuned in and cable, um, please, by all means, there's an 800 number, you'll see it appear periodically. Please use that to call in. But what I'm going to be looking for is uh, if you can help me identify a concept or a term or a vocabulary word uh, that I'm going to be uh, looking for because I have a particular problem. Uh, and my problem is I don't like canned green beans. Now, I don't know where I should put this to see if you guys can focus in on, on, my, on my experience with uh, the beans. Let's see where I can put this. Uh, I don't know, uh, let's see, right here. Well, anyway, I'd, let's see if you can focus. Go ahead, let me see if I'm putting it right. I don't like canned green beans. 
I just don't like them. Uh, when you take a look at these canned green beans, they, they look slimy, they look alien, they look, uh, 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 they're just terrible. Uh, they're, they're, they're green, slimy, alien, waxy. Uh, I just don't like canned green beans. Now, on the other hand, uh, I like red beans. You see these red beans? Red beans, those are delicious beans. I like red beans. Red beans are delicious, but I don't like canned green beans. Um, green beans, they just, they just don't do it for me. I like, I like the red beans. I also like um, white beans. You know, white beans, white beans are delicious. I, I like white beans. I like, I like red beans. See? Red beans, they come from Louisiana, man. These are delicious beans. You can use them in salads. Uh, you can use them with, with uh, chili beans or whatever, however you make them. Uh, white beans, white beans there come from Peru. Peru, those, those beans, uh, uh, Peruvians uh, use them for different kinds of dishes. Uh, today we use white beans uh, for, I think they reduce them into so that you can, you can get uh, uh, baked beans. Uh, but uh, canned green beans, they just are, are, are not very tasty. Then there's what black beans. See, black beans, black beans are from Guatemala. Black beans, boy, when you make them with chorizo, they are delicious. But canned green beans, the greens just go. I, I just don't like them. I don't like canned green beans. When you take a look at these beans, these beans are delicious. And then, of course, there's always the yellow beans. And the yellow beans, those are delicious too. You can use them in, um, in, in soups and salads. Uh, but the canned green beans, they just slimy, they're green, they're alien. I don't like canned green beans. And then, of course, if you put all the, you know, the red beans, the yellow beans, and the, uh, the black beans, and, and you get the white beans, and then you get the red beans, okay, and you put all of those together. All right, let's see if we can get the camera back so I can get all these flavorful beans together. Well, you get down and you get brown beans. And those beans, those are probably the best. And why are they the best? Because, man, everybody has a gas with these beans. So these are, these are delicious beans, see? But when you take a look at, oops, 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 I'm having too much fun here. When you take a look at the canned green beans, the green beans, they just, they just got to go, okay? These beans are delicious, no problem. I love these beans, all right, these beans, but these, they just do not go. They're slimy, they're green, they're alien. And so what I'm looking for is a concept. I'm looking for a term. I'm looking for uh, 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 something that's going to help me appreciate what it is uh, that uh, I'm doing with these beans because I don't like these beans. They're green, they're slimy, they're alien. And so the word that I'm looking for, since nobody's uh, calling in or no one's responding, and perhaps maybe the crew, uh, maybe I can hear you and see if you can give me some ideas about what vocabulary word I'm looking for. <clears throat> but the word that I'm looking for is prejudice. I have a prejudice. I have a prejudice against these beans. And one of the things that I did with regards to the prejudice is that I had a means of action. I used the means of action by which to describe my prejudice, by which to carry out my prejudice. Okay, So I have a prejudice against these, these beans. And so I have a means of action. And the means of action that I used to carry out my prejudice was a stereotype. I created a stereotype. I called them slimy, green, alien beans. So with regards to my prejudice, the means of action that I used to carry out my prejudice was to call them names. I called them green, slimy, alien beans. So I created a stereotype about my prejudice. Now one of the things about my prejudice and the means of action that I used to carry out my stereotype <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, is that there is a social result. And that social result is avoidance. I don't want to hang out with these beans. I'd like to hang out with these beans. Now, these beans, they're delicious. These beans are okay. I like these beans. I will hang out and eat with these beans, but I will not eat these beans. I don't like them. So the, the social result is <clears throat> avoidance. Okay? So, <clears throat> again... One of the things that's important to appreciate is that there is a concept that I was looking for. There was a means of action that I used to carry out that concept. And then there was a social result. And so concept, means of action, social result. 
And that concept, of course, was prejudice. The means of action that I used to carry out my prejudice was <clears throat> um, a stereotype. And then the social result of my stereotype was that I'm avoiding. Okay? So this is at a personal level. Personally, I do not like canned green beans. Personally, I like all of these beans. These beans are delicious. These beans, they're green, they're slimy, they're alien. So now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to move it further. This was my personal prejudice. I don't like canned green beans. What if I were to try to take my personal prejudice and put it in the public, make it part of the public good? So that means I'm going to go out into the market because in the market, that's where the public interacts with each other. At home, in my own personal level, I don't like canned green beans. No problem. That's my personal problem. I don't like canned green beans. I'm prejudiced against them. But if I were to take it out into the public, now there's something different here. What if I wanted to influence the public and say, hey, public, don't participate or don't let these beans participate in the market like these other beans. These beans I like, but these beans I don't. So let's say I wanted to take my personal prejudice and put it into the public. So make it part of the public good. So that means I have to take that into the market because the market is known as the public good. Okay? So let's say I wanted to open up a restaurant and in my restaurant I will of course uh, serve these beans but I don't want to serve these beans okay so let's say in the restaurant I want to put up a sign that says no dogs no canned green beans allowed in essence the greens go okay the greens go but I want to serve these beans so I want to make sure that in my restaurant these beans don't get served I'm gonna serve these delicious beans but I'm not gonna serve these beans okay so, what do I have to do? Well, again, I'm looking for a concept, the means of action, and the social result. So now the, the concept that I'm going to be looking for is that now in the public, these beans aren't going to get served like these beans. These beans are delicious beans. They're more flavorable than these beans. So I'm wanting to put a sign up on my restaurant that I opened up where I'm not going to serve these beans. And this way I can get influence the public by which to make sure that at least at the local level these beans won't be served and then eventually I can get uh, uh, my <clears throat> representatives in Congress to see if they could pass legislation by which to say, okay, let's not serve these beans anywhere. Okay? So the concept that I'm looking for is discrimination because once I move my prejudice and move it into the public arena, then discrimination takes place because now I'm putting a restaurant up and I'm making the restaurant uh, go ahead and uh, allow these beans to be served. I'm going to then take a look at these beans. They're so delicious. Just take a look. Even the packaging is so important. Whereas these beans, these are just green, slimy, alien beans. These, these are more delicious, don't you think? Look at that. Red beans, black beans, white beans, yellow beans, and then get down, get brown beans. All of these beans are really good. But the canned green beans, they got to go. Now, the, the, the concept that I'm looking for to, in order to put the sign up, of course, the concept is discrimination. Now I am practicing discrimination. Okay? Now the discrimination is that I am not, I'm putting a sign up and I'm saying these beans will get served, these beans don't. So there's a means of action that I'm using to carry out my discrimination. And that means of action is what's going to allow me to put that sign up is, of course, the law. It, I'm making it legal. I'm going to my city council, or let's say here at, 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 at uh, Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, I want the food service not to serve canned green beans. I want them to serve these beans, but not these beans. So I'll get student council and, and the Senate, the faculty senate, and uh, the administration to kind of pass uh, rules saying no canned green beans allowed. Then I can go to Carson or the local cities, city councils. Maybe they can pass ordinances by which to say you cannot 
serve these beans, these beans. So what it is that I'm doing is now I've moved my prejudice into the public arena. Before my prejudice was just personal, but now I'm moving my prejudice into the public arena so it has a different kind of flavor. Now it becomes discriminatory. So I'm practicing discrimination and the means of action by which to pass, make that discrimination viable is the law. I've gotten the law behind me to ensure that I don't have to serve these beans, okay? That's very important. Now, there is a social result. Remember, there's a concept, means of action, social result. Well, there's a social result to the discrimination and making it legal. And the social result, of course, is that now I have put these beans in a disadvantaged position. These beans are disadvantaged, okay? I, I don't like these beans. These are green, slimy, alien beans, and I'm not going to serve them in my restaurant. So one of the things that happens is that, of course, when the beans are wanting to be in the restaurant, I'm going to say, look at the sign, and the law says you're not allowed. So that's very important. Again, and what happens is that these beans become disadvantaged. Now, I want to introduce you to another concept, and then we'll take a look at, again, the concept the means of action, and the social result. So I'm going to introduce you to another concept. Let's say uh, now with these beans, these beans live in a particular neighborhood, and if you take a look at, like in the grocery store, uh, these beans are all together in a particular part of the grocery store, and these beans don't join them. They're all out there with the vegetables. They're out there with the corn and the, and, and the, and the, and the peas and, and the carrots, you know? They're not with, they're not with the beans. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but anyway, that doesn't have, make sense anyway. But I'm going to be looking for a concept, a means of action, and a social result here. Now, the concept that I'm looking for is I don't want these people's in these beans in the neighborhoods, in my neighborhood, okay? I don't want them around me. I already know that I don't want them in my restaurants. I don't want them in the public arena. Now, I don't want them to come into my neighborhoods. So the next concept that I'm, I'm looking for uh, is uh, segregation. I want to segregate and make these beans not a part of the community. So the concept that I'm looking for is segregation. And segregation, in order for me to carry out my segregation, in order for me to make sure that these beans don't come into my neighborhood, is of course I'm going to go to my legislators to see if I can pass laws. So the means of action by which to carry out the segregation is the law. I make it legal, okay? I'm having, making the, the process legal so that it ensures that th these beans do not live in the same neighborhood as these beans, okay? So <clears throat> that's very important to understand. And what happens is that there's a social result for these beans. And the social result is that these beans now become isolated. And when you have isolated that experience, well, that's very important to understand. So let's take a look at the overall picture uh, and understand what it is that I've been introducing simply because I don't like canned green beans. These green beans are slimy, green, and alien. And I have gone from prejudice and I moved it out into the public arena. So if we can get that first uh, uh, PowerPoint slide up so that I can go over what it is that I've introduced in terms of the racialization process, okay? So if we take a look at the concept on the left-hand side, in the center there's the means of action and then the social result. And this is known as the racialization process. This is understood by sociologists uh, and anthropologists as well as historians uh, with regards to uh, practicing uh, discrimination and segregation. So there's a concept, prejudice. The means of action was a stereotype, and the social result is avoidance. Then there's the concept of discrimination. And in order to carry out the discrimination, the means of action was I used the law. And as a result, the, the beings were disadvantaged. And then there's the concept of segregation. The means of action was to uh, make it legal, and so if you isolated a community. So students, please understand this racialization process. This is very important as part of the, part of the immigrant experience in the United States, and we're going to be taking a look at it. But I'm just using beans uh, as uh, a metaphor so that we can under understand and appreciate <coughs> these experiences. 
So let's uh, uh, understand now as Americans, we have come to recognize that everyone has been educated and influenced in society by this process known as racialization. And so what I want to introduce you to is understanding the concept of racism because racism is an instrument of power used by those in power to perpetuate this power. And what I want to do is I want to understand this process carefully because since the inception of this nation, Racism and sexism have operated most effectively at the national level by keeping specific populations in a disadvantaged position through policies that called for the elimination of native peoples, the enslavement of Africans, the disfranchisement of poor whites, the discrimination against women, the conquest of war uh, 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 of Mexican territory, the conquest through war of Mexican territory, uh, the denial of citizenship to Asians, and the creation of an apartheid system that's meant to create a racialist order. So, again, the racialization process, uh, racism, you know, it, it's like diarrhea being inherited. You know, it runs in your genes. Uh, but nonetheless, all Americans have a prejudice. Um, and, and think about all of the prejudices that you have about all of the people that make up uh, this nation. Um, what are all the jokes that you know or you heard about blacks, about native peoples, about Mexicans? about Asians, uh, about women, uh, think about that, okay? We all have prejudices, and of course, a prejudice is a personal expression. So we have a means of action by which to carry out uh, uh, this, this prejudice, and that is a stereotype. So I'm using the beans because the beans, you know, I, I don't like canned green beans, I, I don't, but that's my personal prejudice. It's just that when I carry out my personal prejudice and put it in the public good, then I'm practicing racism, okay? Now, as far as my personal prejudice is concerned, that's just me being bigoted. I'm not a racist just because all of a sudden I don't like these canned green beans. No, I become a racist when I take it out into the public arena and I put these, these beans in a disadvantaged position. When I do that, then I'm a racist. But if it's my personal level and my personal prejudice, I'm not being racist, I'm just being bigoted and, 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 and really dumb because of my personal prejudice. You know, because, you know, canned green beans are, are good. It's just, I don't like them, okay? So, again, when I take my personal prejudice and put it out into the public arena, whereas I'm, where I am going to be putting somebody in a disadvantaged position, then I'm being a racist. But as long as I just don't like them, well, then I'm just a bigoted, I'm a prejudiced, prejudiced person. And then, of course, we, when, once we carry out the personal prejudice to the societal level um, with the law behind me, that is what uh, calls for, dis that, that is the legal discrimination against the population. Okay, so with the law behind me, the population that I'm discriminated against is now in a disadvantaged position. So... Let's appreciate this disadvantaged population, okay? And one of the reasons why I use these beans is because um, uh, it, it helps me and, 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 and uh, you, uh, understand uh, or helps me to explain the racialization process. I just don't like canned green beans. And these beans, I love these beans, but I don't like canned green beans. And I'm using that as a means by which to help us appreciate uh, the experiences. Now. What about these beans? I mean, I, I don't know of any bean that, that doesn't want to be a part of a community. So when we take a look at a disadvantaged community, when we take a look at the disadvantaged beans uh, versus these beans, okay? Um, well, they have to face a four-part process uh, of inequity. So when we talk about racism, when we talk about discrimination, when we talk about... Uh, about uh, 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 the experiences that beans go through, um, it, it's not an easy process to explain, okay? That's why a lot of people misunderstand uh, the experiences that, that, that uh, people who are in a disadvantaged position face in society. And it is very complex and, and complicated, especially for those who are experiencing uh, uh, the disadvantaged position, because this four-part process is not easy uh, one, to understand, because even those who have experienced uh, the discrimination and the segregation 
Uh, even those who have experienced that discrimination and segregation can't understand it either. But this four-part process is very important, okay? First is in this process is social racial discrimination. They have to face uh, social discrimination be simply because in the public arena they are not liked. They are not, they are discriminated against, they're segregated. And most importantly, the racial discrimination. Uh, so you, you, you have to understand that the community that's facing the disadvantaged experience, um, they, um, they uh, uh, well, they internalize it. They internalize the experience, and of course they become disillusioned. Okay, And this disillusionment is very important because uh, the odds are against the targeted population. Okay? Um, when we take a look at that experience, the racialization process, um, we need to understand that uh, acute disillusionment robs life of its meaning. And, and so what happens is uh, this acute disillusionment is tied to the social racial discrimination. But on top of this, let's say, let's say that these beans... In, in order for these beans to compete on the market, and they're always competing on the market, well, they need access to education. And the idea, of course, is they need to go to culinary school so that they become more flavorable. And in, in this way, they can compete against each other for uh, a better positions on the market. So they need access to education, okay? And they're competing against each other to get into the best schools. All of these beans are. There's only so many, so many places in every school, and everybody has to get in, especially in the best schools. So everybody's competing against each other. So you need to have access to education by which to improve your lot in society. Well, what happens in the disadvantaged position is that you don't have access to education. At least you don't have access to the same kind of education as those who are in an advantaged position. So the second part of the process is that you face educational deprivation. And educational deprivation means that uh, you're, you're not going to have access to the best quality education by which to improve your lot in society simply because um, the laws are against you. The laws have been written to keep you in a disadvantaged position. After all, you're being discriminated against. You are segregated. So that community, again, uh, not only having to face social racial discrimination, now they go to an educational process that does not serve their interests. That's just that. And so, of course, if you're not getting access to that education and you're not becoming flavorable, then by the time that you go onto the market to sell yourself for a wage, um, you're not going to be getting the same wages as these people. So the third part of the process is not only social racial discrimination, that's the first one, educational deprivation. The third one is what economists and sociologists call economic marginality. Now, economic marginality is also a historical term that helps us appreciate something about um, the experience. Facing economic margin marginality is basically what you face in terms of what is known as a dual wage structure. One wage for the, uh, those who are in a privileged position, another wage for the disadvantaged. And so, again, the idea in terms of economic marginality is that it's a dual wage system, is that you're living in the margins of society. You're not making enough money by which to survive so as to be competitive on the market with all of these other flavorable beans. See, these beans, they have the advantage these beans don't have the advantage. And it's very difficult, again, to understand the disadvantaged position because even those who are in a disadvantaged position, they don't know what's going on. They can't explain that. They can't explain the social... They understand the social racial discrimination, but they don't see it that it's tied to the fact that their education has been deprived, the fact that they are also experiencing a dual-wage system. And then the fourth process, the fourth part, and this is the, 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 the most controversial, is of course the laws are against them. So how can they participate in society if the laws are against them? So they need to have access by way to the political process because it's in the political process that the laws are being passed to discriminate against them. So they need access they need to be enfranchised. And what happens in this community is that they are politically disenfranchised. So the fourth part of the process is political disfranchisement or disenfranchisement. And in fact, it's called the right to vote. 
They endure political disfranchisement. The opportunity to influence the political making process that impacts their life, well, they don't have it. They don't have access to the political process. They don't have access to to the political process where they can at least get a representative for their community uh, elected so that that representative can kind of influence the decision-making process to stop the laws that are discriminated against them. So it's very important to understand this four-part process. And students, you're going to be having to, under, with, with regards to the exercises, you need to appreciate all of these uh, experiences, the four-part process. The racialization process is very important. When you're in a disadvantaged position, that four-part process becomes important. There's, there's the four-part process, the political disfran uh, social racial discrimination, political disfranchisement, educational deprivation, economic marginality. So please, students, get to remember this. This is going to be so important uh, throughout this course, especially as, you're going to be, as we're going to be dealing with all of the different experiences of the different immigrant populations. Okay, so one of the things that's most important is that the community itself, the community of beans, uh, you know, in this particular case, here's these flavorable beans. There's, you know, the brown beans, the yellow beans, the white beans, the black beans, all of these flavorable ones. But these, the greens, they go. The greens go. They're not wanted. They're not part of the society. Now, what's very important is that all beans want to be accepted. I don't know of any human, I don't know of any bean that does not want to be a part of the larger bean community. Okay? So, Everyone, one of the things that's most important is that this community responds in different ways. There's different responses uh, to the racialization process. And, and, and one of the things is no community responds the same okay, to that racialization process. Everybody does different things. And that's okay. That's the way the community responds. Now, most important is that these beans don't like these beans. Why do you look so different? Why are you, in, if we go to your neighborhoods, why are your neighborhoods so violent? And, and is it safe to even go to these neighborhoods? Okay. Um, why is it that you guys have to do things so differently than us? Why can't you be like us? And so, of course, there's going to be a lot of beans who are going to want to be like these beans. And so they'll do whatever they can to be accepted into these beans. They'll, they'll change their names. Uh, you know, don't call me green beans anymore. Uh, call me, you know, uh, uh, French, French style, whatever. Whatever it is that they can do to to kind of be accepted. Maybe they don't want to be green. Maybe what they do is instead of going out into the sun, maybe they'll stay inside and maybe they'll, they'll turn brown so they can hang out with the brown beans. Or uh, I don't know, they might have difficulty trying to be white with the white beans. Uh, maybe they don't, you know, whatever it is that they're going to try to do, uh, maybe change their, their names, uh, change their names to, to English names, or maybe change their names uh, so they won't be in their language. Uh, maybe they'll change the color of their eyes. Maybe they, they don't want to see if they can change the color of their skin. Maybe they'll, they'll do certain things, color their hair, do whatever it is that they can by which to be accepted. So, uh, and, and then these beans, of course, are, are looking at these beans and say, well, why do you have to be so different? Why not? Uh, join us by trying to look like us. So sociologists and anthropologists use the term that helps us identify that kind of response, and that is assimilation. Assimilation. Why don't you assimilate and become part of us? Drop your culture. Drop your identities. Drop what it is and be like us, because after all, we're having a great time. We're in an advantaged position. So why, why, not, why don't you just try to be like us? And there are those beings who say, okay, yes, uh, we're going to try to be like you. We want to be like you, okay? If my name is Miguel, well, I'm going to call myself Michael, okay? Uh, if my name is uh, uh, Fraga, instead of Fraga, I mean, call me Frega, okay? Uh, whatever it is that it takes by which to be accepted, okay? But, um, and I remember my mom, because I didn't, I didn't like canned green beans, and I remember my mom when she was trying to get me to eat them, uh, she, she made them with chorizo and tried to hide them in, in scrambled eggs. And I said, no, 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 no. They're still canned green beans. I don't like them. I see them. I'm not going to eat them. Okay. So one of the things that happens with those who do assimilate is that they still experience the racialization process because no matter how much they try to look like them, they're still canned green beans. Okay. They're still separate. Okay. So 
that's assimilation. Not all communities respond the same way. There are those who assimilate. In fact, those who assimilate are not a significant part of the community, although there are those that part of the community who do assimilate. The majority of the community, they don't want to disturb anything. And so what they do is they try to accommodate or they adapt to the racialization process. So accommodation and adaptation, that's the major response of all communities as they face the racialization process. All communities try to adapt, try to accommodate. In other words, they want to balance the demands of the outside world with their rich heritage. And so, um, uh, okay, uh, with regards to uh, accommodation and adaptation, I'm gonna, a student has just uh, asked a question. Thank you very much, Adam. I'm gonna get to your question uh, right now after I finish uh, this, these responses. Um, one of the things that's important, uh, again, is, is accommodation and adaptation. The majority of people are always accommodating or adapting. They balance the demands of the outside world with their rich heritage. Okay? So that's important. Okay? Then, finally, th there's a third response. And the third response is usually based on the... And, and the third response is, is, is a very, very important response. The majority of the population does not do that, but there is a significant minority within the population that does this because they influence how everybody else responds. And that's the community that's living within in the disadvantaged position. And they don't want to assimilate, they don't want to accommodate. What they do is they resist. Because one of the things about acute disillusionment in the disadvantaged position is that it robs life of its meaning. And when acute disillusionment does that, then you have to find something from within the community by which to say, you know what? I'm proud of who we are. This is our neighborhood. This is how we live. And so through resistance, they address the four-part process. Through resistance, they say, you know what? We need to stop the social racial discrimination. We need to... to confront it whenever we see it because it's not right. And then the other is access to education. We need in our neighborhoods the notion that we should have good schools, that, that through the public good, we can improve our lot. And so we need access to quality education. And then the next is the dual wage system, economic marginality. We live in a poor neighborhood. And because we're getting poor wages. So we need to organize into unions so that we can get decent wages. So they're organizing into unions by which to say we need a decent wage to survive so that we don't live in the margins of society. How else are we going to improve our lot? And then the third is political action by which to gain the right to vote. Because what happens is, especially, is the laws are against you. And so the means of action is to gain access to the political process by which to gain the right to vote. Okay? And so it leads us to a question that a student uh, has asked. And thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam, for participating in class. I'm so glad uh, that you, uh, you read the syllabus and, and you, you came in. It says, are you able to elaborate more on political disfranchisement? I don't understand how people become disfranchised if everyone has the right to vote. Well, that's, that's the whole nature of the debate, um, uh, Adam. One of the things that I'm, I'm addressing here is, in terms of resistance is that the civil rights movement, that's what it was all about. The civil rights movement, it came in the 1960s. And so when we take a look at the civil rights movement, we take a look at Asian American communities, at African American communities, at Native American communities, and the Mexican American community known as the Chicano movement, all of these movements for change, along with the women's movements and the gay liberation movement, okay, all of these movements organized in the 1960s by which to address the racialization process, by which to address sexism, because sexism, just like racism, uh, again, uh, that's the disease of America, all right, and homophobia. So all of these movements for change attempted to address the four-part process. And yes, we do have today laws that address the disenfranchised process, but the whole notion has been to try to take away those rights to vote. 
And in this particular case, we're going to be taking a look at the immigrant community because the immigrant community is still disenfranchised, Adam. So when we take a look at that, we'll be addressing those issues, Adam, and thank you very much f f for uh, that, uh, that experience. Okay, <clears throat> so again, uh, when we understand these particular experiences, this is the racialization process. Again, the concept, the, the, the means of action, um, and, and the social result. Those are very important. Now, how did I come to choose the beans and why did I become choose the beans? Well, I was blessed in my life. Um, okay, I guess uh, there's, there's some technical difficulties that we're going through. Uh, or is it just me that I'm hearing? Uh, okay. Um, let, me, let me just, uh, why, why did I choose the beans? Well, you see, I was blessed in my life to have worked with Cesar Chavez th three different times. Um, and and in, that, um, in, in, in that experience, um, you know, the man was, was, was such an a, a, a awesome presence and a um, very humbling presence. And one of the things that I liked about what, what he did is every time that he uh, uh, gave a talk, he started out with the, con the, the, process, the, the concept of we are all human beings, but in his accent, you know, it sounded like beans, not beans. Beans, not beans. And so, you know, for me, I, I, as I was saying, well, how do I explain the racialization process? How do I explain racism? Because racism is a very difficult concept to kind of grasp. And <clears throat> so I use the beans. We are all human beings. I, I got that from Cesar Chavez. Um, human beings, but it's just because he couldn't pronounce he didn't, you could never tell the difference between beans and beans, beans and beans. So, so that's why I said we are all human beings. I don't know if you can focus in on that right there. Um, if you see uh, my shirt, you'll see many times I'll be wearing shirts that will kind of share that. But can you guys focus in on my shirt here? Um, if you can, uh, let's see if right here, where would, there it is, there you go. You see that? We are all human beings. And I got that from, uh, again, my experiences with Cesar Chavez. And I, I want you to know that I, I, you know, I still don't like canned green beans, but the whole idea behind the civil rights movements and the movements for change was to get the federal government and local governments out of the business of discrimination and segregation. That's what it is. And that's why resistance is so important. Resistance to that because the resistance movements address the four-part process. They address political disfranchisement, educational deprivation, social racial discrimination, and economic marginality. That's what it's all about. So those who resist, they're few in number, but nonetheless, they impact society tremendously because the majority are accommodating. The majority are adapting. There are those who have assimilated. There are those who just, you know what? I'm not that. I'm somebody else. I don't even want to be a part of my community anymore because when you take a look at the disadvantaged communities, they've got a lot of problems. Okay? When you take a look at that four-part process, there's a lot of problems in the community, especially with regards to drug abuse and the violence involved in that, the, the drug abuse. Okay? Um, so the community does have problems, but those who resist are saying, I'm proud of my community. I'm proud of what's happened because that's the community that we live in. That's what we have. You know, despite the violence, despite the experiences, that's our community. So we need to do something about our communities and we need to ensure that these communities become viable. And so you see that throughout the United States of communities taking action to say, we need to stop these drug wars. We need to stop, we need to get the children in appropriate schools and we need to have appropriate jobs and we need appropriate experiences in the community because again when you live in that disadvantaged experience acute disillusionment robs life of its meaning and you can imagine how alcoholism and drug abuse just impact these communities so these communities <clears throat> resistance those who resist are very important because they influence those who are accommodating and they challenge those who are assimilating to do something about the communities, to come back to the communities, not to leave the communities, but to come back to the communities and reinvigorate them with positive, positive experiences. So please understand the racialization process, okay? 
Again, racism is an instrument of power used by those in power to perpetuate their power. That is so important, okay? Because ultimately, what happens... Well, what's the ultimate experience? Because you see, I, don't, I know of no child being born a racist. When we take a look at racism, I know of no child being born a racist. If you could put that up on the bottom thirds, uh, I'm, I'm there right now. Yes, because how does a community learn to hate? How does a community all of a sudden just go and address these beings as something that should not even be around? Because what is the next step after, after segregation? Well, all you need is one incident and you have the community up in alarm. And the next incident, of course, is the hysteria that leads to hate. And that is elimination. Because now, when you have a whole community, a whole society saying, you know what, these greens have got to go, the greens go, then what we do, the ultimate solution, is the alienation, the elimination. And so you make it legal, and what happens is you've committed genocide or ethnocide or whatever side you want. Okay? So when we take a look at the racialization process, if you can put it up, we take a look at the last step. I talked about prejudice, discrimination, and segregation. How does a society learn to hate? And that is elimination. The idea is to remove, through legal means, that community. And so, in essence, you've committed genocide and ethnocide. And that's what the debate is right now with regards to the hate that's being practiced by these neo-Nazi groups. If you've understood Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, what's happening in, I mean, Charlotte, Virginia, Charlottesville, um, uh, this last weekend, and the, the results of that experience. We're taking a look at elimination, removal, and genocide. Uh, that is the ultimate step. Okay, so this is what the civil rights movement was about, getting the government out of the business of discrimination, out of the business of segregation. Okay, um, and of course, those who resist uh, challenge the U.S. warmongers in Congress and the military to get out of the business of elimination and making sure that police departments understand how all lives matter, okay, especially black lives. Um, let's go to a film clip to understand something about how the United States has already gone down this path with regards to Native peoples. Bigfoot's band was intercepted by the 7th Cavalry. The officer in charge found Bigfoot wrapped in heavy blankets, dying from pneumonia in the back of a wagon. Bigfoot was ordered to make camp along Wounded Knee Creek. In the morning, his people would be stripped of their weapons and escorted to Pine Ridge. Bigfoot made assurances of his peaceful intentions, and the band made camp. He's a peaceful man. He's, he's always say that, uh, think about the elderly, think about the children and the woman. And uh, don't start the trouble. Morning broke after a sleepless night surrounded by soldiers. Huck Woju witnesses would later recall what happened next. Bigfoot, who was sick, came up with a flag of truce tied to a stick. Dewey Beard. As soldiers trained their guns on them, Bigfoot and his men brought forth all their weapons, placing them near the white flag of truce Bigfoot had planted in front of his lodge. The soldiers then searched their tents and wagons for arms, even confiscating cooking and sewing tools. As Bigfoot's people gathered around the flag of truce outside his tent, four powerful Hotchkiss rapid-repeating guns were mounted above the camp. I noticed that they were erecting cannons up here, also hauling up quite a lot of ammunition for it. They encircled us like a band of sheep. I could see that there was commotion amongst the soldiers, and I saw on looking back 
They had their guns in position, ready to fire. Thomas Tibbles, a white reporter who followed the troops to Wounded Knee, recorded what happened next. Suddenly I heard a single shot from the direction of the troops. Then three or four, or four a few more, and immediately a volley. At once came a general rattle of rifle firing, then the Hotchkiss guns. An awful noise was heard, and I was paralyzed for a time. Then my head cleared, and I saw nearly all the people on the ground bleeding. My father, my mother, my grandmother, my older brother, and my younger brother were all killed. And he saw his mother walking toward him. She was walking along and she was shot. Dewey, she said, keep walking, my son. She said, keep going. She said, I'm going to die. And that was the last time he saw his mother. The women, as they were fleeing with their babies, were killed together, shot right through. And after most of them had been killed, a cry was made that all those not killed or wounded should come forth and they would be safe. Little boys came out of their places of refuge, and as soon as they came in sight, a number of soldiers surrounded them and butchered them there. American Horse, Oglala. The firing continued for an hour or two, wherever a soldier saw a sign of life. With the sunset, the weather turned intensely cold. About seven o'clock that night, the 7th Cavalry brought in the long train of dead and wounded soldiers and Indians from Wounded Knee. 49 wounded Sioux women and children had been piled into a few old wagons. The wounded Indian women and children were eventually carried into an agency church where they lay in silence on the floor beneath a pulpit decorated with a Christmas banner reading, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men. Nothing I have seen in my whole life ever affected or depressed or haunted me like the scenes I saw that night in that church. One unwounded old woman held a baby on her lap. I handed a cup of water to the old woman, telling her, give it to the child, who grabbed it as if parched with thirst. As she swallowed it hurriedly, I saw it gush right out again. A blood-stained stream through a hole in her neck. Heartsick, I went to find the surgeon. And for a moment, he stood there near the door, looking over the mass of suffering and dying women and children. How oh, the silence. The silence they kept was so complete it was oppressive. And then to my amazement I saw that the surgeon, who I knew had served in the Civil War attending the wounded from wilderness to Appomattox, he began to grow pale. This is the first time I've seen a lot of women and children shot to pieces, he said, and I can't stand it. Thomas Tibbles, reporter. For three days, the frozen bodies of the dead, including Bigfoot, lay where they fell at Wounded Knee. Finally, the army dug a large trench at the massacre site. Then, as they collected the bodies, a blanket was seen moving. Beneath it, snuggled against her dead mother, was a baby girl. Again, the, with regards to the racialization process, all right, what is the next step after segregation? How does a society come to hate? How have Americans come to hate a targeted population? So to commit genocide is an abominable act. Again, I know of no one born a racist or a sexist or a homophobic. But Americans can frighteningly go down this path of hatred 
just like the Germans did with Hitler and the Jews. And of course, what I wanted to emphasize here is that Americans have already carved out this path with native peoples. It's one of the reasons why native peoples aren't around. One of the reasons why there are reservations. Why there is the state of Oklahoma. How did native peoples become mascots? So all Americans need is some hysterical moment where the national character can get whipped up into a frenzy and uh, there goes all the liberties that have been written in the Constitution to prevent things, such things from happening. But this is what happens. This is one of the reasons why the United States experienced the Civil Rights Movement. And it was the 1960s. So in this class, in this class we will take a look at all human beings. All human beings. But we're going to start out with the red beans. Okay? And we'll appreciate the red beans. Then we'll move to the white beans and understand the white beans. Then we'll move to the black beans. Okay? And then we'll understand something about the yellow beans. And then finally, when you put them all together, you get down and you get the brown beans. So we'll take a look at Native America, at Native America, at European America, at African America, at Asian America, and then at Latin America and the Mexican experience and realize that we are all human beings, okay? We are all human beings. So this is my bean presentation. Um, and a, a lot of the times everybody's always asking me, you know, how I'm doing. They all ask me, how are you beans? And I say, my beans are fine. My frijoles are fine. So uh, that's what I use in terms of my beans. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be bringing up these props periodically. But, uh, uh, by the third session is when I'll start with the Native American experience. Okay, so uh, let's, let's go to a film clip that shares with us the racism, the institutionalized racism, and why I continuously uh, uh, harp that, remember, you can be prejudiced, you can call people names, you can call them the stereotypes, you can avoid them, but that's at your personal level. That doesn't mean you're a racist. You're just prejudiced, you're bigoted, you're dumb. You're dumb. But when you take it out into the market, when you take it out into the public good, and you put somebody in a disadvantaged position, then you're practicing racism. Then you're a racist. Okay? But please understand that. That's the process. That's the racialization process. Just because you call somebody, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is that you're going to call them, it doesn't mean, that just means that you're dumb. I mean, you're practicing your prejudice. Um, that's your personal choice. But in the public arena, when you influence somebody else's life uh, because of what you're doing, you're practicing racism. Okay, so let's take a look at um, a brief history of white privilege. Never underestimate the power of the people when they understand the message. Never underestimate that. I think that this is something that can be done quite quickly. I think it's something that can be done rather efficiently. It's just going to require a large enough parade. It's going to require a large enough people to understand the core concepts. And that's the real work that we have to do right now, mm -hmm. is, is hit that, that critical tipping point, which is probably around 20 or 30% of the, of, the, of the voting populace actually understanding the issue. And a big part of the issue when creating a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy movement is an understanding of how race and racism were constructed in the United States through law and how those laws informed our culture in much the same way those corporate rights have been constructed through the law to ensure rule of the wealthy minority over the majority, and how our culture reinforces and legitimizes that lack of democracy. Right from the very beginning, Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution defined people as property. You see, the authors of the Constitution were very interested in protecting their property, including slaves. No person held to service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. The Indian Removal Act of 1830. Indigenous communities are forced from their homelands. Over 10 years, 100,000 native children and adults marched thousands of miles west into unknown arid territory. 15,000 
do not survive the journey. But over 25 million acres of land is made available for white settlers. 1854, the people versus Hall. Non-whites are barred from testifying in court. No black, mulatto, or Indian shall be allowed to give evidence in favor of or against the white man. 1857, Dred Scott versus Sanford. Free blacks are taxed, but still have no rights of citizenship granted to whites. 1862, Emancipation Proclamation in District of Columbia. Slaves are freed in DC, but former slave owners are reimbursed for slaves given up. Whites are paid over $1 million in reparations for lost property. 1862, Homestead Act. 50 million acres of formerly indigenous land in the West, having been violently invaded by US soldiers in violation of treaties, is distributed by the government at low cost to white settlers only. And 100 million acres of indigenous land are given for free to railroad developers. 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act bans immigration of both skilled and unskilled Chinese laborers. 1924 Johnson Reed Act creates an immigration quota system based on national origin, favoring Nordics over the inferior races of Asia and Southern and Eastern Europe. 1934 In the wake of the Great Depression, the National Housing Act is implemented, creating a federal housing authority to provide loans and federal subsidies for home ownership, but the FHA mortgage underwriting standards discriminate against non-whites and investment in non-white communities through a process called redlining. 1942, Executive Order forces 111,000 Japanese Americans into concentration camps. And the war on drugs declared by Richard Nixon violently targets and imprisons people of color disproportionately through today. Righteous anger can only be provoked by anger at injustice and our unfairness. And I'm angry about the fact that we've got 20 to 25 percent of the children in the richest country in the world who go to bed hungry or undernourished every night. I'm angry about the fact that we have transnational corporations that are destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself. And I'm angry about the fact that the world that's being created with the rape and plunder of Mother Earth is a racist, sexist, and class oppressive society. You bet I'm angry. I'm angry because it doesn't have to be this way. Are we in a class war right now? Of course we are. And you know, Warren Buffett, I think, said it the clearest. He said, we're in a class war, and we've been in a class war for years, and my class is winning. And who is his class? The owning class, the people who own these corporations. Okay, so that was uh, uh, the movement to end, to amend. Uh, those of you who are interested in um, ad addressing the issues that this organization raises, but nonetheless, at least they put in perspective uh, the notion, again, of the racialization process and again, racism is an instrument of power used by those in power to perpetuate their power. Very, very important. So let's recognize the racialization process because it is alive and well and operating effectively in the United States today, especially by frenzied, frenzied maniacs that call themselves conservative Republicans or Tea Partiers or Tea Baggers or Minutemen or Patriot Movements. And then, of course, there's the KKK, the Aryan Brotherhood, the neo-Nazis, and of course now, with the, under the Trump administration, what is called the alt-right. Okay? Um, those who listen to Rush Limbaugh, uh, Glenn Beck, and others of their ilk have been fed nothing but hate and lies. So um, let's uh, appreciate the anti-immigrant sentiment and let's go into the next film clip. This land is my land From California To the New York Islands Todo para todos Nada para nosotros This land was made for you and me
This Land is Your Land, performed by Las Cafeteras here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We continue now to look at the humanitarian crisis unfolding with thousands of migrants arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, this week, the Texas town of League City passed a resolution banning undocumented children from entering its municipality and refusing to accept federal funds to, uh, to operate detention centers in the city. The move echoes sentiments that flared up just before July 4th in Southern California when right-wing demonstrators blocked three buses of migrants from reaching a federal immigration facility in the town of Murrieta. Uh, the buses were carrying dozens of children flown in from an overcrowded detention center in Texas. Demonstrators blocked the road and chanted, chanted anti-immigrant slogans. Well, this week, immigrant supporters gathered in Murrieta to hold a vigil calling for compassion. Among them, the parents of two detained minors, aged 10 and 7, who were taken into custody in Texas, are now being held in a shelter awaiting processing. This is their mother, Elva. At this moment, my only wish is to hug my children and to have them close and tell them I love them. I want to be able to recuperate all the missed time that has passed without them, but sometimes it's not possible to make up that time. I just want to make sure that they are okay. This family is from Guatemala. They're among thousands who are fleeing violence there, as well as in Honduras and El Salvador. The New York Times reports Honduran children are increasingly being targeted by gang violence. In June, 32 children were murdered in Honduras, bringing the number of youths under 18 killed since January of last year to more than 400. Border Patrol statistics show a strong correlation between cities with high homicide rates and ways of young people who come to the United States. The United Nations Refugee Agency says it's witnessing extreme violence on the ground in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Asylum claims from those three countries have skyrocketed more than 700 percent in the last five years. This comes as the American Civil Liberties Union and other groups have sued the U.S. government for its failure to provide legal representation to immigrant children in deportation proceedings. The class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of eight immigrants aged 10 to 17, who the ACLU says have not been able to find a lawyer. For more, we're joined in San Diego by Enrique Morones, director of Border Angels. Welcome to Democracy Now! Enrique, can you tell us what happened in that confrontation with migrants, um, young migrants coming into town, uh, and the police and the anti-immigrant activists who blocked them? Sure, Amy. Uh, pleasure to be with you and Juan. So a couple of Tuesdays ago, I was here in San Diego, very busy with our work with Border Angels, when I got a call that uh, maybe I should go up to Marietta because there were some protesters being very loud and, and chanting these anti-immigrant and racist slogans, um, and maybe I should go up there. It's an hour north of San Diego. So I went up there. I went up there, I did a couple of interviews, and I went to observe and what I observed was uh, the freedom of speech and action, which everybody supports. The, the protesters were on the sidewalk uh, yelling their chants and so forth. I was just minding my own business. And then I saw the three buses coming, and, and, and Juan mentioned uh, the buses being turned back. I want to make it very clear that those three buses were turned back by the Murrieta police, not by the protesters, because as the buses were approaching, the Murrieta police stepped in front of the buses and blocked the buses which made absolutely no sense because they could have just kept on driving and got into the Border Patrol facility. So I told, told one of the officers, why are you stopping the buses there? And then a protester came out, and then other protesters came out, and of the 50 protesters that were there in total, about half of them eventually came out in front of the bus, as did about 25 or 30 media people. And they were banging, the protesters were banging the American flag against the bus, screaming uh, these racist taunts. And it was horrific to see because the children inside the bus and their moms were crying. They don't speak English, but they understand hate. And uh, it brought tears to my eyes. And I even saw some media people with teary eyes because we saw the worst of the American spirit. Regardless of how you feel about this issue, which side of the political aisle you're on, these are children. These are children, and we need to embrace and love our children. And a society is judged on how we treat our children. And what we witnessed that day was the worst of the American spirit. And I really believe that that moment will uh, live in infamy, and it can be the turning point, as it already has become a little bit, in this immigration issue. We really need to have humane immigration policies. They don't exist in this country right now. And uh, the whole world saw 
uh, that hateful display of those 50 people and, and the consciousness of this country is saying, that is not who we are. That is not who we are. And I'm asking President Obama that when he t tucks his ch two girls in and they ask him, Daddy, are you doing everything possible to help those children? He can be honest and say, yes, I am, because he stated it's a humanitarian crisis, and it is. We need a humanitarian solution, and we have not seen that. And, and Enrique, when I interviewed you last week for my column in the Daily News uh, on this subject, you told me that you recognized a lot of the most vocal of these of these uh, uh, anti-immigrant uh, activists that day, the protesters from other right-wing uh, movements and causes uh, in the uh, that you that you've witnessed uh, in. Okay. Um, I'm not so sure. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> let's appreciate that. A reason one, one of the reasons why I shared this particular film clip, it happened three years ago, because it addresses the book that we're going to be using, Whose Child Am I? Because Whose Child Am I? Uh, addresses what happened to those children from um, Central America who had all of a sudden appeared on the border. And uh, in this particular case, several were sent to um, uh, Murrieta, and there was this community that uh, spewed out its its uh, racism against <clears throat> these children. So it's most appropriate to understand the anti-immigrant bashing that's going on today. Um, Brenda, thank you very much, Brenda, for participating in the class. You have a question. Can you explain more on resistance turning violent versus peaceful resistance? That's what this course is going to address uh, with regards to resistance, Brenda. We are going to be taking a look at different movements for change from all of the different experiences. When we take a look at Native American, European, uh, <clears throat> Asian, um, Latin American, Mexican, uh, and all of these, all of these uh, uh, experiences, peoples just didn't sit back and, uh, uh, and just mildly accept the racialization process, but they resisted. And most resistance movements have always been peaceful, but it is the state that has the weapons of violence. And the state, because the state is practicing the racism, they don't want to stop it. And so they use the violence on the peaceful demonstrations. Okay? And that's what's most important to understand. Now, when we take a look at demonstrations. It has been documented by social scientists that when we take a look at why demonstrations turn violent, it is because the state has sent provocateurs to encourage the violence so as to address that. Now there have been certain groups that have practiced violence and when we take a look at what happened last week uh, in Charlottesville, the um, alt-right came very well prepared with guns and with violence and uh, they were not at all peaceful. So when we, when we understand something about resistance and the questions that you asked Brenda, um, recognize that all resistance movements are addressing issues and then, uh, and then from there take a look at, at, at the questions of violence. And in this class we will try to appreciate that. But thank you Brenda for asking the question. And uh, again, uh, Brenda and Adam, I certainly appreciate your contributions to this class. Now let's get to, to understand the vocabulary that we're going to be using in this course to help us understand what it means to be an immigrant in this country. So the first vocabulary word we need to come to terms with is migration. Yeah, because after all, if you take a look at this is immigration in the United States, that term migration is part of immigration. So the beginning of the immigration process is a decision by an individual or a family to migrate. So migration, that's very important. That is of movement from one place to another. So as we will be reading in the required textbooks in the United States, we take migration largely for granted. But people are constantly migrating. Okay? It is a phenomenon that has been taking place uh, since the original inhabitants of this land have existed and taught us how to appreciate the earth. People since time immemorial have moved across this turtle's back from desert to plains, from rivers to coastlines for economic survival. 
Today, people move from city to city or region to region searching for economic existence. And that's the key, economic existence. So when we take a look at migration, again, that's a process. It is a decision made by an individual or a family to migrate. And usually it's because of economics. So when migration or a movement of population occurs and a people cross a political boundary that's created by modern nation states, it's called by a different name. Now that term becomes immigration. Okay? Uh, some of you have perhaps heard emigration. Emigration, immigration. But at the basic level, it is still migration. But what makes immigration different, of course, is that you're leaving one country and entering another country. Hence that migration gets a political statement. It's emigration because you're leaving a country, immigration because you're entering a country. So as we're going to learn in this course, emigration and immigration are collective terms. Individuals who leave one country are known as immigrants, and when they enter a new country, they become immigrants. Now, why are the people migrating in the first place? Because they are searching for opportunities to continue their economic existence. People are constantly searching for economic survival. And most often, people want to make sure that they can achieve a subsistence level that guarantees that their families will be fed, clothed, and sheltered. So in this way, we can appreciate that throughout human history, people have migrated throughout the world in search of a decent human experience. Okay? Now, the next one, very, very important, is formation and control of labor forces. Very key here to the class. It is important to understand that wherever there are economic systems, that have been established. Labor forces are required to create the infrastructure that facilitates the exchange of goods and services in that market. So consequently, history reveals that systems are constantly looking to form and control labor forces so as to create markets, as well as build the monumental architecture that's designed to enhance the exchange of goods and services. So throughout history, we witness the formation and control of labor forces in order to facilitate the enhancement of economic growth and development. Whether it be organized through voluntary labor agreements, or whether it be organized through enslaved labor agreements, or through contractual forms of labor, systems desire people's skills. Systems desire people's knowledge, experience, assets. It is in this way that systems recruit workers. So workers migrate to areas where their labor is valued, where their labor is required, where their labor is appreciated, where they are recruited to work. So we want to appreciate that throughout the historical development of the United States, there is a constant need to form and control labor forces. So when workers migrate to areas where their skills and their knowledge are in demand, the receiving country creates a process where these recruited workers are going to be contributing to the social order. This means that the receiving country creates laws that allow these migrants chances to become participants in civil society. In other words, the receiving country provides an avenue by which people who arrive to work become active participants in the social order that creates the wealth. In other words, when they are recruited to come to work in the United States, the, 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 the question is, the question becomes citizenship. This is a very important process. Formation and control of labor forces, you're bringing workers, that's called immigration policy. So you're bringing workers. Workers come over here to the United States. They find work. So the question becomes, how does one become a citizen since after all, they're working in the system. They're working in the system regardless of how they were brought here. They're in the system, they're working. So a person who's working in the system, they're a participant in the creation of the common good. They are working. They are participating in the common good 
They're participating in that public arena. They're participating in the market. They're creating the wealth that sustains the general livelihood of the social order. So this discussion brings us to the franchise. To be in franchise means to be an active participant in the decisions that create the social order. The franchise means that you are part of the decision-making process that gives direction to the social order. So as a worker, when you're recruited to create the wealth of a nation or a system, how are you given the opportunity to become part of the social order? How are you given an opportunity to direct the social order? In this case, how are you enfranchised to give voice to your contributions to the commonwealth? This is what enfranchisement means. Okay? Now let's go to a very, very important dimension, and that is immigration and labor organizing. Because when we take a look at throughout the history and development of capitalism in the United States, workers have always sought to be represented in the decision-making process that determines the public good. So when we look at the history of labor organizing okay, in the United States, and we're going to learn that in this, in this class, because immigrants coming into the U.S., have always organized for their rights. And it's from the beginning, when the immigrants came in. We will learn that. We're going to learn that from the white beans. We're going to learn that from the black beans, from the red beans, from the yellow beans, from the, the, the brown beans. Okay? The idea, the struggle is you create unions that guarantee subsistence, existence to workers. The idea is to gain a living wage. And that Brenda, Brenda has been fraught with violence because the state has sanctioned violence against those demonstrations. And they've always been peaceful. It was immigrants who started the first unions. Throughout U.S. history, immigrants have always challenged organized labor to support their cause. Organized labor likewise is recognizes the merits of supporting the organizational struggle of immigrants. Today, immigrants in this country have provided a tremendous boost to the labor organizing efforts in the United States because immigrants are the new backbone of labor. So let's go to a film clip sharing with us uh, the coalition of Immokalee workers and how these immigrants are con continuing the tradition that we're going to be understanding from the previous immigrant groups uh, at the turn of the century, of the 19th century. For generations, farm work has been one of the lowest paid and least protected jobs in the country. Los sueldos han caído en términos reales desde 1980, que provocó al Departamento de Labor de los Estados Unidos llamar a los trabajadores agrícolas una mano de obra en gran peligro económico. 90% of this country's winter tomatoes are grown right here in Florida each year. Farm workers have historically faced regular abuse in the fields, including wage theft, sexual violence, and in the most extreme cases, forced labor. The Coalition of Immokalee Workers, a human rights organization, is rewriting this history through its Fair Food Program, a groundbreaking model of social responsibility based on a unique partnership among farm workers, growers, and major retail brands. Its goal is to raise wages and affirm the dignity of workers in the fields. Hoy, el programa por comida justa ha empezado a transformar la industria y a proteger los derechos humanos fundamentales de los trabajadores. Here's how it works. Buyers like Subway, McDonald's, and Walmart each pay growers a penny per pound premium on tomatoes, which growers pass on to their workers in the form of a bonus. More than $14 million in just three years. To participate, growers must adhere to the Fair Food Code of Conduct, which outlines workers' new rights under the program. Fair Food Farms ensure zero tolerance for forced labor. 
Prohibitions against verbal and physical abuse, including sexual harassment. Safe working conditions, such as shade, clean restrooms, and drinking water. The right to report abuses without fear of retaliation. And a fair wage. The Fair Food Standards Council is a third-party monitor created to investigate complaints and ensure compliance through regular audits on the firms. The Fair Food Standards Council also staffs a 24-hour hotline for farm workers and helps them navigate a complaint resolution process whenever there's a problem on the farm. Bajo el programa Por Comida Justa, la Coalición de Trabajadores de Inmocali conduce sesiones de educación de trabajador a trabajador para informar a los trabajadores de sus nuevos derechos y sus responsabilidades. To enforce these standards, participating buyers commit to buying Florida tomatoes only from growers in good standing with the program. Pero todavía hay trabajo que hacer para expandir esos cambios pioneros más allá que la industria de tomate de Florida. Your role is critical. You can help expand the Fair Food Program and eliminate human rights abuses in the fields. Juntos podemos asegurar que el nuevo día amanecerá no solamente en Florida, sino por más de cientos de miles de trabajadores agrícolas en todo el país. Find out how you can make a difference. Go to fairfoodprogram.org. Okay, so that's the importance of the immigra immigrant experience and labor organizing. Immigrants have always been part of the unionization efforts. Um, again, when we take a look at the history of labor organizing in the United States, the struggle to create unions and guarantee a subsistence existence to workers has always been fraught with intense conflict. So immigrants started the first unions throughout the U.S. And throughout U.S. history, immigrants have always challenged organized labor, and they're doing that to this day, as we can see through the coalition of Omokali workers. So let's go to another term, and that is assimilation. And in assimilation, uh, when you come into this system, again, what's, what, what the system is different than what you're used to. How much are you willing to give up in order to be acknowledged as a member of the system? When we take a look at immigrants coming into this country, Immigrants are always willing to assimilate. Okay? Assimilation is a general requirement for citizenship. You have to learn the language. Uh, you have to adhere to the customs. Uh, you have to become uh, uh, and, and become part of the consumer, the consuming society. So most immigrants have always um, participated in the larger society, and they and they endeavor to become a part of the community. So. The reality of the situation dictates that the assimilation process requires different kinds of generational experiences, and we are going to understand that assimilation. Okay? This is what the immigration process is all about. So another term that we're going to be dealing with is assimilation. Um, let's define some more terms. Permanent residents. Permanent residents, are these are immigrants who have entered a country under the provisions of the immigration law, and the name suggests a great deal about their status. They may remain in the U.S. permanently under the status unless they give up permanent residence by moving abroad for lengthy periods or by committing a crime which results in their deportation. So <clears throat> most often a permanent resident, this is the process. Once an immigrant is accepted into this country, they get their permanent residency first. And so they have five years uh, and then they are given the option of naturalizing as a U.S. citizen. So we'll explore this later in the course. Then there is the term undocumented workers. To those who enter a country without legal residence or authorization, they don't have documents to prove their official entry. These immigrants we will identify in this course as undocumented workers. Now, most often, the U.S. media and other society and our society at large because they think that these peoples, because they have come into this country without documents, that they are criminals. And so the connotation illegal uh, is very important. They, they call them aliens, illegal aliens. But I have never seen an alien before uh, outside of what Hollywood has created for the general public consumption. And how many times do we get fascinated by outer space beings coming to Earth and destroying what humans have created. Okay, you know, the Transformers are every, all these aliens coming out. Um, think of all those alien beings 
who are weird and unfriendly that Hollywood has implanted in our cultural dialogue. Okay? Um, of course, the one that was most impressive that started out everything was E.T. I mean, uh, E.T. Uh, I don't think E.T. Uh, ever identified himself as illegal. He was just an alien from outside the universe. But I have never seen an illegal alien. Never in my life. So does that mean that E.T. doesn't have the right to phone home? Uh, has anyone ever encountered an illegal E.T.? Um, if so, does ICE or Immigration and Customs uh, Enforcement allow E.T.s to phone home? Um, in this course, we will refrain from using illegal alien. It is a derogatory and inhumane term to address a situation that people don't have control over. And that is that they don't have documents, but they're workers. So these are undocumented workers, undocumented immigrant workers. Okay. Now the next phrase is human trafficking. The next concept, there is a term that we're going to be used to identify people who are forcibly moved, removed from their homes to new markets for labor-related purposes. Now historically, we need to appreciate this human trafficking because it was known as slavery. And this kind of human trafficking has had major repercussions because we still have uh, the, the post-traumatic slave disorder in our society and that's why we have Black Lives Matter. And Black Lives Matter is very important because we need to address human trafficking, the consequences of human trafficking. And basically, there is this phenomenon that has expanded, especially in the Asian communities. So human trafficking is a crime against humanity. It involves an act of recruiting, transporting, transferring, harboring, and receiving a person through the use of force, coercion, or other means for the purpose of exploiting them. So in the United States, here in Los Angeles, in all of the major cities, uh, thousands of men, women, and children fall into the hands of traffickers. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in fact, every country in the world, every capitalist country, uh, especially the United States, is affected by this trafficking. Um, because the transit or the destination of its victims, uh, the United Nations has addressed. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes, uh, the guardian of the United Nations Convention Against Trans Transnational Organized Crime and the protocol thereto, assists states in their efforts to implement the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons. And this trafficking in persons is very important because it is a lucrative industry. Um, it is now the fastest growing criminal industry in the world. And globally, it is tied with the illegal arms trade as the second largest criminal activity following the drug trade. So most major forms of trafficking include forced labor, sex trafficking, bonded labor, dead bondage, involuntary domestic servitude, forced child labor, child soldiers, child sex trafficking. So in our course, we'll refer to slaves uh, and those swept into the web of human trafficking as involuntary immigrants. Then there's refugees and asylees. The second category of immigrants who has neither rights nor opportunities as the permanent resident is the refugee or asylee. Refugees are individuals who emigrate in the face of persecution in their home countries. Uh, asylees are immigrants that are already present in the United States who cannot return home to their home country because they face persecution upon return. So asylees and refugees are people who have well-founded fear that they will be persecuted in their home country because of their race, religion, nationality, political opinions, or membership in a particular group. Refugees apply for refugee status, and if they are successful, they are given travel documents that they can use to enter the United States. Asylees are people who are already in the United States or at a U.S. port of entry when they apply to live in the United States. Okay, another concept or term that we're going to come to appreciate is naturalization. Now, naturalization is a term that we will come to identify as a process that immigrants enter, those who have acquired the status of permanent resident can enter to become a citizen of the United States. In addition to the five years of residence, the U.S. requires that naturalizing citizens complete an application, and demonstrate an understanding of U.S. history and civics and of spoken, written, and English, of, of, and, it's, and of spoken, written, and oral English. Plus, they must swear allegiance to the U.S. And then finally, one of the most important terms is nativism. So, 
nativism. This is what we're going to be addressing because it is surrounding us today. And this whole issue with regards to immigration. Why do Americans find reasons to criticize immigrants coming to the United States? Why do Americans find reason <coughs> to disdain the immigrant presence? This phenomenon encourages us to understand the term nativism. Let's appreciate what nativism means. To be nativist means that you do not like people who do not look like you, who do not talk like you, who do not behave like you. You have a concept of being an American. This is what the United States has. You are an American. So who is an American? What does an American look like? Obviously, if that American doesn't look like you, doesn't, doesn't participate in society like you, then that person must not be American. That person must be alien. Okay? But everyone should look like an American. So what does an American look like? Unless, of course, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're something else. So the nativist character, this is nativism, the nativist character is related to a person who's living within the United States system and confronts others by challenging them to be like you. This character is important because it helps us rationalize the prejudices that we have of every ethnic and racial group existing in society today. Nativism undergirds our prejudices. This character helps us rationalize a policy that insists on uniformity. So immigrants who enter the United States with a different language, with a different culture, with a different historical expression, they must be illegal because they're not like us. They don't fit into society's definition of self. They are foreign. They are alien. This is the nativist character. Let's go to a film clip and appreciate this nativist character in this administration. Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Wednesday marked the biggest single day of changes to U.S. immigration policy in recent memory. In a news conference at the Department of Homeland Security, President Trump announced and signed two executive orders to begin construction on the border wall between U.S. and Mexico and to crack down on those who cross it. The Secretary of Homeland Security, working with myself and my staff, will begin immediate construction of a border wall. So badly needed, you folks know how badly needed it is as a help, but very badly needed. This will also help Mexico by deterring illegal immigration from Central America and by disrupting violent cartel networks. As I've said repeatedly to the country, we are going to get the bad ones out, the criminals and the drug deals and gangs and gang members and cartel leaders the day is over when they can stay in our country and wreak havoc. We are going to get them out, and we're going to get them out fast, and John Kelly is going to lead that way. The construction of the expanded wall is expected to cost tens of billions of dollars. It remains unclear how Trump's directive will pay for the project. Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto vowed Wednesday night not to pay for the wall. Okay, uh, this is nativism. And it's practiced at the highest level of government. And again, remember, racism is an instrument of power used by those in power to perpetuate their power. And we have one of the most racist administrations in power today. Uh, this anxiety, this nativist character influences immigration reform. It is part of official policy. Senators and congresspeople carry the nativist influence of society. And senators and congresspeople, they make policy. They make laws governing who should enter the United States and who shouldn't. They create the legislation that regulates the formation and control of labor forces for the development of markets. The federal government decides which labor forces should come into the United States to work for the development of markets to, uh, that extend from Boston to New York to Cleveland and Chicago. So if you could put up, we need to understand how nativism influences policy. And this is what we're going to understand. The federal government brings labor forces for the economic expansion of this dynamic market. 
Consequently, Congress decides which people should come into the system and which people should be deported from the system. Congress decides to form and control labor forces that will create the markets we so much enjoy. And Congress creates immigration reform. Congress creates immigration legislation. So whenever there are economic labor necessities, the remedy becomes immigration recruitment. And when those labor necessities are satisfied, usually an economic downturn occurs, and the remedy becomes immigration restriction legislation. Okay? So let's understand immigration restriction legislation and deportation. It is a federal policy, and it is not a state expression. And it is a state expression. So let's recognize, if, if you could put the last uh, fifth PowerPoint slide here, to understand how we have a deportation nation and how uh, federal uh, nativism influences the policy, okay? So let's look, go to uh, bring up this slide full and recognize this is what we're going to be appreciating in this class. Next week, I'm going to address all of these issues uh, so we can understand something about the laws that have been passed and why we are a deportation nation. So let's go and appreciate uh, what happened with regards to the Middle East and uh, uh, people's, uh, what, what Trump did with regards to, and how the people responded to when Trump attempted to prevent refugees from the Middle East from coming to the United States. <laughs> Again, I just wanted to kind of uh, bring the class to an end with regards to this experience. Um, there's so many different communities in the United States that are part of the immigration experience. And again, uh, the federal government is the one that brings labor forces for the economic expansion of this dynamic market. Uh, New York, Cleveland, Chicago, Boston, Atlanta, Houston, Colorado, and then all the wonderful cities in California. They're all filled with immigrants from throughout the world. So consequently, Congress decides which people should come into the system and which people should be deported from the system. Congress decides to form and control the labor forces that will create uh, <clears throat> the markets we so much enjoy. Hence, Congress creates immigration reform and legislation, and this is what this class is all about. So welcome to this class, students. Uh, we're going to have a, 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 a very nice journey uh, through the experiences, uh, 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 through your experiences, we will make this journey uh, incredible. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Brenda and Adam, for participating, and we'll see you next week.